completely song of Aleut. Our host has wine. A pleasant evening is ensured. He's invited a fine musician to play the Guangling San. Moonrise at the city wall. A few crows are flying. Frost has gripped ten thousand trees. Wind cuts through our robes. With a bronze stove burning, candles add more light. As he begins to play, clear stream, then concert chew. One note, and already all the world is hushed. Guests listen, rapt, as stars slowly fade away. My orders are to travel onward a thousand miles to Huai. There I tell them clouds and mountains mark my journey's end. So, uh, we have a, a little poem here. It's not too big. That's one, two, three, four, five couplets. Title Song of the Lute. And this and the following two poems by Li Qi, will, which are also heptasyllabic old style poems, will also be poems about music and about banqueting. So, the more socially oriented, symposiac type of poetry. It's quite evident that the topic of this poem is therefore uh, enjoying music with friends, a symposium, drinking probably, although that is not clearly stated in in the poem. There is wine, so it, there's wine because people are going to drink it, obviously. So the main topic, I would say, is uh, enjoying the company of other scholar officials in drinking and, and, more importantly, in listening to music. Music occupies a center stage in this poem. And there is another sub-theme, you could say, especially in the end, which is serving in office, uh, parting, and uh, retirement, all in one couplet. So it's a pretty loaded couplet at that. First, a couple of uh, considerations to clarify. The first is uh, the poem is called Song of a Lute. Now, that title might be a bit misleading. When we think of a lute in the West, we generally think of of, you know, this guitar-like instrument with a, a big uh, resounding box. And sometimes a very long bridge, typical of Baroque music, for example. And uh, this is not the instrument that is being uh, referred to. The instrument here is the chin, which is more like a thither, which is, you know, like a small horizontal instrument with some strings attached uh, to the top. And it was the symbol, the instrument that was the symbol of the scholarly uh, class. In fact, one of the four great achievements of scholars that they were supposed to engage in in their free time was playing the chin. And, but of course, lute sounds more poetic in the West than Song of the Thither. Another thing is, uh, because this is a poem about music and about music that is being played, you get references to different songs, so we'll comment that when we get to them. I have no specific information about any of the songs or suites of songs that are mentioned in the poem. I imagine they have been lost with time, or at least their melodies have. More generally, uh, it's important to perhaps introduce the concept and the importance of music for traditional Chinese society and for the Confucian scholars in particular. Now, music is very important in the oldest Chinese classics. In fact, one of the lost classics of the Confucian tradition was a book on music called uh, the Jue Jing, the classic on music. In the Confucian texts and scriptures, music is very common. It's called Jue in Chinese. It's very often equated or joined together with ritual, which is of even more importance in Confucianism. Probably it's the most important thing for Confucianism, apart from its uh, ethical and moral postulates, uh, the importance of ritual, which receives uh, a lot of uh, sacral elements. It becomes a sort of uh, secular, uh, sacred practice. But uh, we're, we're skipping, we're moving from our point. So music usually goes with ritual. Now, ritual in the Chinese traditional society is very important for ordering people, for hierarchies, for classing people, for putting them in their proper place, for treating others with respect, uh, harmony, order. These are very important ideas of the Confucian school. The Confucian school was born in the Warring States period when China was in what they perceived to be a chaos. 
with multiple small states at war with each other. Inside each state, the different social classes at each other's throats, uh, the feudal lords conspiring against the king, the ministers of the feudal lords conspiring against the feudal lords, the sons uh, and wives conspiring against the husbands. So Confucian ideology very clearly emphasizes the importance of order, of harmony, of everybody being in their proper place and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So ritual is very good for this because ritual marks the hierarchies. You make a ceremony, some people are at the front or are more honored, some people are at the back and less honored. Music is related with this though because music also includes harmony and you know order, hierarchy in ritual are connected with harmony in art and music. The sort of balance and equilibrium of combining the different notes and the different melodies equates with the social ordering of people. Besides, music is uh, more amenable, more entertaining, more accessible than ritual as an art form. And uh, it's therefore used uh, uh, sometimes in, in the opposite way as ritual. So in, in, if ritual emphasizes the differences and the hierarchies, music helps to create a communal, uh, a communal intermingling, a, a union, a collective, uh, in spite of those hierarchical differences. And this can be seen in this poem where, you know, all of the listeners to, to the song, you know, are merged into one and appreciate the loveliness of the music. So let's go on to the poem then. The first couplet. Our host has wine. A pleasant evening is ensured. He's invited a fine musician to play the Guangling San. So we start with a convivial atmosphere. There is a party. We don't know exactly where we are. We're probably in the capital. Uh, we don't know who the host is either, but the host has wine. He has invited different scholar officials or friends to a feast. There's going to be drinking and uh, there's going to be music and not ordinary music, which there almost always is in a party. We have a specially good musician that is going to play the Guangling San. Now, Guangling San, as far as I've been able to check, is just a suite of, of, of music from the Tang period, probably, that refer to events in the remote past. And we will see two examples of Guangling Sang songs mentioned, referred to. Moon rise at the city wall, a few crows are flying. Frost has gripped ten thousand trees, wind cuts through our robes. As in many Chinese poems, we get that sort of focalization which goes from the more general and exterior to the inner. So first we got the introduction, there is a banquet. Now we get what's happening outside of the banqueting house, of the banqueting hall. It's probably winter. It's quite cold. Yeah? The frost has gripped 10,000 trees. It's night. The wind cuts through our robes. So it's at least late autumn or winter when this, uh, when this party is taking place. And it's at night. And you have the moon rise over the city wall and a few crows flying, which creates a nice image of colorful contrasts between the whiteness of the moon and the black specks of the crows flying in front of it. In some translations of this poem, it's also emphasized or, or, or it's shown that the walls are turned white because of the light of the moon. And so we get this black and white color contrast. So it's cold outside. What's happening inside, the next couplet tells us. With a bronze stove burning, candles add more light. As he begins to play, clear stream, then concert chew. So the fine musician that was mentioned in the second line is inside the hall. He started playing music. As opposed to the black and white atmosphere of the outside, we have a luminous and bright atmosphere in the inside. This is created by a bronze stove, which we might imagine generates heat, warmth, but also light, and also mm, a lot of candles so that everybody and everything can be seen quite clearly. The musician is playing two songs. I don't know anything about them, Clear Stream and Concert Chu, but they're probably songs referring to the, the golden age of the past and about, you know, based on stories. The next couplet uh, tells us the effect that the music is having. Not only are we inside the hall, now we go to the inside of the people's hearts, to their feelings. What is the reaction to the music being played. One note, and already all the world is hushed. Guests listen rapt as stars slowly fade away. The music exerts its magical, its bewitching, its seductive power. Everybody is listening, enrapt, and 
they so enjoy the musical concert that the night passes all along, the stars disappear from the sky. They spend all night listening to the music and they hardly notice the passage of time. This is the mystical, the magical power of music, which is often referred to in a lot of uh, Chinese poems and texts. And finally, as usual, we get a couplet which, uh, instead of being a philosophical summary of, of what has been said before, uh, leads us again in, in this focusing from the more general to the more specific to the feelings, to the thoughts, not of the people at the concert, but of the poetic persona of Li Qi himself. What is he thinking of? My orders are to travel onward a thousand miles to Hawaii. There I tell them clouds and mountains mark my journey's end. So Li Qi has been given a post. He will have to part very soon to the Huai River Valley. Uh, we know he was he had a minor post for many years in that region. I think he was a district enforcer in the in the Huai River area. So he's thinking, mm, I have to leave these people very soon. I have to go to my post. Shall I tell them? Yeah. So you, uh, the last line has been interpreted in different ways by different poets. So one way of interpreting. Uh, it is saying that that uh, the poet is doubting if he should tell other people uh, that he is going to that remote, well, not, not that remote, but relatively uh, remote and unurban area as a, as a governor, that he has to go on his way to cross through clouds and mountains until he reaches his journey's end, which will also be a landscape with, uh, which has lots of clouds and mountains, I presume. So this is one possible interpretation. Uh, the other possible interpretation is that his journey's end, especially because he talks about clouds and mountains, is not really the thousand miles he's going to travel to Hawaii. Perhaps he is hinting at his desire in a not-too-distant future to retire. Remember, clouds and mountains are generally associated with hermits, so I'm not sure if the Hawaii River area had specially famous uh, sites related to clouds and mountains, but if it doesn't, the, these clouds and mountains probably refer to a wish to say that my, the end of my way is not going to be uh, the governorship of that Y area. The end of my, uh, of my travels is going to be the retired life, the hermit's life in a mountain among the clouds, a floating cloud myself. So, okay, uh, not a bad poem. Mm, I felt it was pretty conventional, like the previous one, the farewell to, to Chen Zhangfu poem. Uh, perhaps this is a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little bit more vivid for me, perhaps because the images are more effective and, and the tone is less flattering, uh, you know, it's less sycophantic than, than the one that could uh, transpire in the previous poem. So, okay, not, not a bad poem, not a bad poem.